Hi everyone and welcome back to Nursery World 2020. I'm here with the wonderful Dr. Stella Louis and she, for those of you who don't know, is a wonderful consultant. She's a traveling um, Freubelian tutor and she's got a particular interest in observations and schemas and that's just some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Stella, thank you for being here. Um, so today at your talk here, you were talking about observation in the early years. And I wonder whether you, you feel like perhaps we've, we've lost a little bit of our understanding about what the true purpose of, of observation is when it comes to, to early years practice. Um, I think I do think that observation have been, they've been diluted um, throughout the sector. I think the early years is, you know, it stands on observations. You think about the work of Susan Isaacs, for instance. It's all about child observations. I know what to teach based on what I see. I think observations have been diluted. I think there is two agendas. I think there are some practitioners that will just match their observations to the curriculum goals. And what happens there is that it becomes a, a tick list, it becomes quite superficial. Um, and what really concerns me is when that happens, it's not about the child anymore. We lose sight of the child and it's just about all these different procedures that children can do. So yes, I do think, I think observations have been really diluted and I, I think to add to that, I trained as a NNEB nursery nurse and that's something I'm really proud of. Um, and I did in the first year, two year course, first year I did uh, 120 observations across the zero to seven age range. Second year, same thing, and alongside a baby study. And I studied people like Froebel, Vikoski, Piaget, Susan Isaacs, Montessori and more. And having that child development theory knowledge gave me understanding of, of what I was seeing. And practitioners coming through don't have access to that depth of knowledge of child development so so to some degree i suppose what you say it, it's become a it's become a, a a tool a little an observation and as you say in some cases a, a checklist and really it's 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 not about what you're creating it's about what you're doing and what you're noticing it's about the observing i suppose absolutely it's about what you notice it's about what you recognize it's about how you respond it's about how you reflect it's about how you modify your environment it's about all of those things it's not just about one and i think ultimately it's about when you're watching children you need to be thinking about what it is you're seeing um, so externally your body's quite passive but internally you're like why is that child doing this what is he you know what is his purpose what is his goal rather than like oh this is a waste of time and, and 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 i've had practitioners say to me i'm not watching that child it's a waste of time i can't see what he's doing and i've moved from being upset with them to understanding that actually you don't know what you don't know. If you don't know that actually there's a reason behind what that child is doing, I cannot expect you to support it. And, and, and that's difficult. One thing I'd love to just have like, really clearly elucidated is that idea about why using, for example, Development Matters in, in the case of the UFS as a checklist, or, or, or even just tacking on you know, statements from that to observations. Why is that, in your view, such, such an issue? I think it's an issue because um, when the Early Years Foundation first came about in 2008, it was made up of the curriculum guidance for the Foundation Stage 2000, and of which the first 25 pages were absolutely brilliant. What I didn't like about the further pages was that there was an indication that development, you just kind of went on stepping stones. But actually development learning is not just one way. You go back, you go to the left, you go to the right also. But the first 25 pages, brilliant. And if you can see that you can go backwards and forwards, the rest of it's fine too. The other document was Birth to Three Matters, and I still believe that was the best document the early years sector had. Those two documents were brought together. And actually that was a really fundamental document. And I think how it was produced the first time in terms of the outcomes for children, I think there was a disconnect. And then I think in 2012 it got reviewed again and 2000 and, yeah, but the 2012 edition, it went from being quite overweight to anorexic. I mean, it's fine for a practitioner like me to navigate my way around that document. 
I've got understanding of child development and observation. I can fill in the bits that are not there. But for a newly qualified practitioner or a teacher that's new to the field that has no knowledge of child development, it's it's not fit for purpose. And I think I think we need to provide much more guidance to practitioners as to how to use that document. I'm not saying it's a bad document because I know where it's come from and I can track the other documents back if I need to. But I, I, I just think for the skilled practitioner it's fine, for the inexperienced ones lacking in confidence it's, it's not a useful tool because children are seen almost like robots and people are ticking things off and it's just predetermined it's predetermined understandings and some of them are quite superficial. And, and so the, the problem with you using that approach really is that, is that as a document it's not complete enough to be sufficient for, for that but also even the practice by itself is not to truly understand the child perhaps. Yeah, and I, 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 I kind of, it's a useful document, I'm not going to say it's not, there are some things that are useful, but it's just got thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and it's outcome based, it's not process based and I think when we think about how children learn, outcome does not trump process, you know, both things are are important and I think when we're thinking about children and we're thinking about our outcomes and our, our, our school readiness, I don't like that phrase so I use intellectual readiness. I think if children aren't able to um, experience things fully and thoroughly and if adults don't understand that each development stage is important in its own right, the chances are children will be rushed through things so adults can just tick off. So you can see what I said earlier, if we focus on a tick list, we lose sight of the child and we just focus on that document. And actually, childhood is the springtime of life. You know, the richer the earlier experiences, the richer our children. And I think we're always going to have curriculum initiatives, always. But as educators, our pedagogical responsibility is to, to meet the, the needs and interests of children. And I think that trumps the national initiatives, that trumps those slim documents. So I think what you're, what you're saying in a way is that we do have this, this perhaps issue with observation. Of course, we need to change that. And, and, and part of what you're doing here today with the CPD you were delivering is, I suppose, about that. But how else do you see that we can make this, this change to make practitioners again very understanding of the, the deep nature of child learning and see that in their observations? I just, I don't think it's a one size fit all. I'm, I'm going to be quite upfront about that. I think different folks, different strokes. Um, in one setting you can have a broad range of experience and knowledge and expertise. I think it's about ways of helping practitioners come together so they can talk about what they know about children's learning and finding ways to share that knowledge in the team. So not people kind of going away on courses, but, but just finding really creative ways so that we can make the time that children have with us the best. We can make those early learning experiences rich experiences. And also, I think being able to talk about children you might say something about a child that I'm working with that I don't know, but it's only when we have that dialogue, that interaction, that you're going to inform how I respond and react to that child. And I think practitioners know a lot about their children, and that's my starting point. What they sometimes don't know is how to articulate what they're seeing. That's why I think they need help with understanding um, the structure of how children learn or, or the network of learning. I think. Professor Tina Bruce has written many, many, many fantastic books on how children learn and, 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 and the important role of adults in developing that learning. And I would sort of like say that practitioners need to read, they need to, they need to do all sorts of things. Um, but if you're going to work with children, you need to understand how they learn. And on that, I suppose, what I'd really love to know to kind of round off about observations is, is, is in your mind, what does a truly high quality observation look like? What is the kind of creme de la creme of observations in, in your mind? I think the creme de la creme of observations would be one that has many features of play. So it would be things like children maybe using play props, children in control of their play, um, children maybe pretending, 
um, children working collaboratively. There's a whole range of things, children representing different things in their play. And I think there are lots of things that you will see in children's play. Tina Bruce has written features of play. And actually what I would say is if you're observing play and you don't see some of those features, it's an indication to you that actually maybe you need to help that play. Um, so I think there are many features of play. Um, yeah, playing alone, children pretending, whether it's fantasy F, whether it's fantasy PH, whether children are being literal or whether children are making one thing stand for another, whether children are showing you their feelings, their ideas, their relationships, and already I've said things that if you don't understand what I've talked about, you're not going to notice those things when you see it. And that's why understanding the structure of play is of critical importance. And I think even simply children playing alone, there are some educators they're always wanting children to play with another, but actually solitary play is, is hugely important. Um, I think play is children's work, um, and it's too important to be left to chance. Wonderful. And I guess actually one of, I know you're one of the sort of foremost, foremost figures on schemas, and it's something you've written, written about widely. I, I wonder whether kind of a lot of what we're talking about and truly understanding children is exactly that. It's about also perhaps trying to improve that knowledge of schemas in practitioners so that they can see that deep level learning happening? I think I've learned not just to talk about schemas in isolation. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Because I think schemas is part of something much bigger. Schemas are biological, we're born with them, they're with us, birth right through till death. But actually, if, if, I, if I use my hand, schemas is just my little finger. Before schemas, you've got first-hand experience, you've got struggle, you've got manipulation, and you've got manipulation and discovery, you've got practicing newly acquired skills. And once you've practiced your newly acquired skills, then you get the schemas, which is the repetition, so you can appreciate. If I'm only focusing on what they're repeating, I'm not really seeing what skills they have, what they've manipulated, what they've discovered, what they've explored, or, or what they've struggled with. It's about looking at the whole. I'm not prepared to look at a particular part of children. Uh, yeah, schemas in isolation, I think, is can be superficial. It's about looking at it as part of the whole. Schemas are biological. The schemas are what children do. And my role isn't to um, defend or justify schemas. I'm an observer. Um, I'm a practitioner. I'm a mother. I'm an auntie. I'm a grand-auntie as well. And observation is what I do. And when you watch children, if you understand what you're seeing, you will realise that there's sense in that nonsense. You will realise that you have to help them to find answers. Um, and whatever they're doing, there will be a reason. You just might not know what it is. And, and that's why you're kind of inside thinking about what it is you're, you're seeing. And I suppose on that, it's, that's a really interesting point. I know another thing that you're, you're, you're probably in travelling, or tutor, as we said, um, said before, and what is it perhaps that inspires you so much about that particular pedagogy? Why is, why is it that, that that's kind of been the pedagogy that's really followed through your kind of career? I think I've been intuitively Frobelian. But I think I kind of first came across Froebel when I was doing my baby study. He, he did a lot of work around kind of, you know, sharing knowledge with families. And I remember at the time um, having to do an assignment about kind of working with parents. And I drew on Froebel a lot. I spent the last nine years doing a doctorate. And once I learned the methodology, I was able to achieve it. But nine years is a long time. Froebel challenges me in a way that my, my doctorate can't. Froebel challenges my very core. It makes me think about my practice. So for instance, um, there are lots of Froebelian principles, there are about 10. And one of them is that, you know, um, what a child can do is the starting point of that child's education, not what a child can't. And I think for me, that means so much to me. That's so important to me. Um, 
and I think it helps to ground me because the minute whether I'm working with children or whether I'm teaching staff in Australia, South Africa, wherever, if I start with what they don't know, I've lost it. I have to start with where they're at, what they know. And, you know, I can get to where I want to get to in the end, but that might take time. Wonderful. I think that's a fantastic place to finish. Thank you very much. Watch out for more videos coming up over the next few weeks. I'm going to be speaking to lots of wonderful people over the next week. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Stella, for a fantastic, fantastic interview.